The goal of this study was to help us fathom this most mysterious part of biology, the brain. Uh, and our goal in this particular case was to do that by looking at brains, by describing them at very high resolution, at the resolution where every single cellular element and many of the intracellular elements of the nervous system, such as synaptic vesicles, mitochondria, spine apparati, uh, were described. And by making such a detailed description, we hoped to see if there were any facts about that description that were not predictable from more macroscopic and frankly easier ways of studying brain. So how did we go about converting a piece of real mouse brain into a piece of digital brain which we can analyze in the computer? To do that at electron microscopic resolution we have to cut a piece of real mouse brain into thousands of ultra-thin sections and reliably collect them so that we can image them all in a scanning electron microscope. So Ken Hayworth, together with Bobby Casturi and Richard Chalek, came up with a new method which they called ATOM, which stands for Automatic Tape Collecting Ultramicrotome, which picks up the slices as they come off the ultramicrotome onto tape, and we can then image these in a scanning electron microscope. Next, we took the images we acquired in the electron microscope and I wrote scripts to align them into a three-dimensional volume, which we then analyzed in the computer. We used manual and automated methods to do the segmentation. For manual segmentation, I wrote a program called VAST, which is essentially a digital coloring book with which we segmented axons, dendrites, synapses and organelles in our volume. In collaboration with a group of Hans-Peter Pfister here at Harvard, who is a computer scientist, we developed automated methods to do segmentations, and part of the data set which is in the paper was actually segmented with automatic algorithms. Just segmenting the data is not sufficient. We also have to put it in a form that is mineable. We generated a database of 1,400 synapses, which is accessible online through our collaboration with the Johns Hopkins Open Connectome project run by Randall Burns, Joshua Vogelstein, and others. When we mined the 1,400 synapses in our dataset, we were struck by how often the same axon made multiple synapses onto the same dendrite. An axon that runs through our fully reconstructed volume meets many spines and chooses a small subset of them to make synapses. Which spines are chosen appears to depend on the identity of the axon and the dendrite. The significance of this work, especially the question of the non-random relation between axons and dendrites, is that there are properties in the identity of axons and dendrites that cause them to connect with each other that go beyond simply where they're located in the tissue. Uh, there has been a hope, I think, that if one knew exactly where axons were and exactly where dendrites were, one could predict the connectivity between them uh, by virtue of something known as Peter's Rule, after Alan Peters, who insists he does not even espouse this idea. Uh, but the idea is that for one reason or another, uh, predictions of connectivity require knowing where axons and where dendrites are, and that that is uh, not only necessary, but sufficient. Our data, I think, shows that Peter's rule uh, is not the case, at least in this piece of neocortex. Axons and dendrites that overlap exactly the same as other axons and dendrites that overlap have very different connectivities based presumably on the properties of the axons and the properties of the dendrites. Those properties we don't 
understand, uh, but this is a mystery that is certainly worth following up on. This provides us with a more accurate view of what the brain actually looks like. Although that more accurate view is not synonymous with a clearer view of how it works, it's not that we understand it better by having this view, we understand at least by looking at this detailed analysis of what the brain is, how far we have to go before we have understanding. I think there's never a place in biology where knowing more is worse than knowing less.